for those of you who don't know David Lithicum, uh, I've known him for quite a while. David Lithicum is a uh, is the chief cloud strategy officer at Deloitte, where he uh, works works with a lot of clients who are implementing cloud at scale. In the past, he has worked at Cloud Technology Partners, which has been um, acquired by HPE. Uh, you probably have read a blog by him uh, in a lot of places. He writes for InfoWorld every week for years now. He's pretty much one of the pioneers of cloud computing and wrote, wrote about cloud computing when you know a lot of people were still struggling to understand it. Um, and I, I'm super excited to get his perspective. Uh, if you did not get what we were talking about governance score at a higher fun level uh, by me and Corey, but David and Travis will definitely go a bit deeper. Travis is the CEO of Stacklet. Uh, the Stacklet team uh, has a lot of maintainers and core contributors for Cloud Custodian. And we are also building solutions on top of that. Travis himself is uh, is a tech executive, been in tech for a while. Um, and most recently, he was part of the Capital One team as well. And he talks to a lot of people who are adopting Cloud Governance as code. And both of these um, um, speakers today have can provide a lot of insights on how do you actually define it? How, do you, how does it look in practice to someone new? Travis, take it away. And David, take it away. Thank you, Amir. Uh, much appreciated for that wonderful intro. And I certainly am excited to share this presentation with David. Uh, David? Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. And I want to tell you um, one of the most important things that, uh, that people need to learn around implementation of cloud computing and cloud-based systems. Governance is necessary. You know, I kind of look at governance, security, and operations as the three core legs of the stool and what keeps um, deployments of systems, not just cloud systems, but multi-cloud complex systems that are interacting one to another, working and playing well in the proper way. Um, and governance in a nutshell, and it was, it was, it was talked about uh, during the last time, that ultimately this is a set of guardrails we put around various systems. And governance kind of has a, um, a, oh, kind of a bad word history. Back in the enterprise architecture days, governance was uh, people who walked around and made sure that we were leveraging the same operating systems, the same databases and things like that. Well, it's changed since then. So ultimately, it is an automated set of processes that we're able to implement centrally or through as code, we're gonna talk about during this session, which is able to protect us from going off the rails, so to speak, on various operational instances. And here's some great stats here, you know, security, governance is necessary security, you know, 99% of cloud security failures will be uh, the cloud user's fault. I'm reminded of an incident where, um, you know, ultimately someone was working on a, configuring a security for an object uh, bucket on a public cloud provider and they had the window opened up to configure it uh, through their own infrastructure um, when they were at their, uh, their kid's softball game. You know, all well and good, they needed to change something, but they forgot to um, uh, close out the window and save things. And ultimately, just like you butt dialed somebody you don't want to call, uh, they ended up reconfiguring the security system by default and exposed that object database uh, as a public cloud so people could access it even with just a browser. And what, what occurred is not necessarily a security issue. Security was running as operated, but a lack of governance. In other words, opening up a browser, leveraging it on the weekend, doing things that are typically out of policy in the way in which the company set things up. And so if just the policies were enforced in that particular instance, they wouldn't have misconfigured the bucket and had a huge security exposure. Ultimately it was fixed and they had no breaches at least they knew of. But that was an instance where security necessarily wasn't the, the hero there, it was governance and the ability to kind of configure things in the way they should be leveraged. And so in other words, it protects us from us. In other words, if I'm developers, I'm building systems and operator, I'm going to set up governance and policies as way in which I can move around um, my systems without uh, you know, going off track. And compliance is another issue. Uh, $14 million average costs of non-compliance. And that's what we hear of. Uh, public relations is an issue if people are out of compliance, certainly if we're dealing with HIPAA laws and other laws. Uh, uh, and, and ultimately, if we run out of compliance, the ability to get things fixed and get things back on track 
is going to be a difficult thing to do. So if you're able to put compliance or compliance as code or compliance as, uh, as governance around various systems, which keeps you out of trouble, which basically aligns to what the laws and regulations are. And so they're enforcing that within the technology track. You can breathe easy because these things will be taken care of for you through the automated policies. And it's always, uh, you know, takes me back that uh, we're not doing this better, spe specifically since there's a cost associated with this and the fees and fines that you put out in making this happen. Finally, ops and costs, 70% were spent on development instance of scheduled, you know, that are scheduled five days a week. The, the reality is we're operating these various systems, leveraging resources and services uh, and doing so with a number of different choices. And we're getting in trouble with these choices. We're, we're leveraging resources in such a way where we're allocating too many resources for the money or the budget of the particular purpose that it's done. And we're going over budget in terms of our ability to use things moving forward. So keep in mind that governance is necessarily necessary because it's multidimensional. It deals with cost. It deals with compliance. It deals with operational aspects and certainly dealing with security and certainly dealing with the complexity of the various systems that we're building things forward. And this is something that is easily fixed, leveraging governance policies and technologies. And it's evolving in a certain way where it's becoming more granular and fine grain, you know, such as governance as code. Let's go to the next slide. So keep in mind, you know, governance is important. It tends to um, uh, be a big inhibitor of cloud adoption success, and it's difficult to enforce at scale. The problem with governance that I see today is people force it to be centralized. In other words, just as we had centralized governance when I was talking about the uh, enterprise architecture stuff, the traditional ways of doing something, that's typically not the best way to do it. So in other words, if we're trying to create centralized policies, they're going to be the same policies no matter what systems and applications and data are attached to those policies. And so what we do is try to orient these policies to particular needs of the application. We create new policies on top of new policies, and we create a governance system that's so complex, we just can't manage it and operate it moving forward. And this is an instance of you know, what we're looking to do. If you see on the left, left side, you have developers, they're trying to be creative and they're trying to build systems for the business they're gonna take the business to the next level. And they wanna move fast, they wanna be innovative, they wanna leverage whatever technology is gonna be best of breed and what they're able to do. And then we're trying to do you know, centralization of resources, cloud engineering, IT ops, things you see on the right-hand side of the screen, and they're trying to stay well-managed. And so they're trying to do things from a centralized point of view. And I'm, I, I emphasize with bo both of them. I, ultimately, the developers are trying to move as fast as they can and even in leverage governance when they can and leverage governance as the ability to build and deploy these systems to make sure that these systems are uh, used in a proper way and used with policies that are surrounding them. And But if we're only going to deploy that from a centralized standpoint, that's going to be a big inhibitor moving forward. So ultimately, we're looking to scale how we're doing this enforcement and either we can do a couple of things. Number one, we can build everything as a big honking governance system that exists centrally that we're able to apply to different systems and different databases and different applications or different code bases and all different kinds of technologies, or we can learn how to decentralize it and do so in a much more fine grained way. Things that are more architecturally optimized that are gonna make sense. So. This is something that we need to keep uh, keep an eye out moving forward and how this stuff really kind of comes together and how it's going to uh, you know, evolve over time. This is something we keep an eye on. Um, Travis, I bet you have some thoughts on this. Yeah, yeah, well, I think first off, you articulated that extremely well. Uh, the point that I would also add just to understand the overall challenge is that the cloud shown there in the middle of the visual is also sufficiently complex cloud providers are innovating at a very high velocity and the APIs that they provide are often non-uniform across the services and certainly non-uniform across different cloud providers. Uh, so this means that governance isn't achievable as a milestone. It, it's constantly evolving and iterative. Would you agree, David? I would agree. You know, ultimately, this is something we just need to think differently about. It doesn't mean that centralized governance is always going to be the wrong answer. Um, but as we start to get into more complex architectures and certainly heterogeneity becomes the norm, 
and certainly complexity in terms of architecture becomes the norm, won't scale. In other words, we just can't, don't have a chance in allowing our uh, centraliz centralization of governance to get to a point uh, where it can allow the organization to move in the directions and at the scale that they need, need to move. So let's go to the next slide. So what do you do? Well, you look at different solutions, different concepts of solving the issue. Um, you know, we can beat our head against the wall and try to do things centrally, you know, whether it's security and operations, things like that. Or we can learn to adapt to the innovative and quick, quick moving nature of what cloud computing is going to be. The developers need to move fast because you've got to remember that digital enablement is a business imperative now. It's not just something that's nice to have, but the ability to differentiate your business based on their ability to be you know, digitally enabled and have all things automated within these various systems. So therefore we leave it to the hands of the developers where they're able to leverage this technology to kind of take things to the next level. So we're looking at the concept and new concepts like this, such as governance as code. We already have infrastructure as code and some bit of security as code and all these sorts of things. This makes sense because it allows us to in essence, localize the governance around the particular application, just like infrastructure, we define the infrastructure we had to use of the resources within the application. So therefore, we're not always trying to uh, deploy things on the same infrastructure. This is purpose built for this particular application because we bind it to the application. Well, the same thing as governance is code. So keep in mind, this is a shift, a fundamental shift that we have to make. So this isn't optional. If we're gonna move into a multi-cloud environment and deal with complex cloud systems and cloud deployments, the ability to leverage governance as code is going to allow us to make those things scale. Actually, it deals with complexity by binding things to certain components, and that allows us to make these things purpose-built for each and every application. That's getting to an optimized architecture, and, and that's really what we're looking to do. So, you know, look at things like Codify allows us to automate cloud governance, you know, via standard, you know, uh, declarative language, it allows developers to work as if they were, uh, um, you know, work while enforcing various governance policies in terms of cost operation, security compliance that's bound to the application. And so they can think about the use of that compliance, think about the use of those limitations, think about the deployment of these policies as related directly to the application. So what are your thoughts on this, Travis? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think I'm seeing in chat, you know, some response from the audience. This is using governance as code to balance infrastructure as code. Right, and the goal is to enable that innovation sought by the various development teams uh, in the organization with the right guardrails, but not do so in that central planning way that creates this, this implicit bottleneck. And my experience from working with organizations who have embraced this model, it allows them to apply the cost, the operations and the security guardrails uh, that they need to be successful uh, and not just do it once, but do it again repeatedly uh, as things are changing within their organization and as things are changing in the cloud, as their developers are embracing new and different technologies that become available in the cloud. Having this model is what is really key for the ones that are able to uh, keep up and adapt and uh, be as agile as they possibly can. Uh, so what I'd like to do is uh, go a, a step further, right? Talk about the principles, what is making this uh, into something that uh, can be a pattern for organizations to pick up on. So the first is having a simple declarative language, making policy creation approachable to the various groups of stakeholders that are uh, you know, uh, in, in tasked and forced to uh, uh, to make those guardrails for their organization. So we're talking about the cloud engineering teams, the FinOps and the security groups, the ones that are trusted to make certain that the health and well-being of the cloud is really uh, top in, in terms of the standards. Uh, so they want to be able to develop something and they want to be able to develop it fast. So you need something that's approachable in terms of a simple declarative language. Uh, so the other, and, and also domain specific, right? Very fit the purpose to the cloud, not something that is, uh, let's say overly general, right? Something that can be very approachable for the challenges that are faced in the cloud itself, the cloud native. 
so the policies also are deployed via GET with CI/CD, right? This unlocks the continuous delivery that you need to keep pace. This is not uncommon uh, in the industry. You see this a lot with application groups, uh, but seeing it for your governance and getting that uh, that that extra gear in terms of productivity is the important uh, part that you wanna make certain you have as a principle for your governance as code. Align your policies with your development cycle. That's really what you're, you're trying to do here. Uh, and then last but certainly not least, the real-time enforcement. True governance means more than just alerting. Uh, governance as code empowers action. Policy violations, we want to be effectively communicated in the organization and then also have the ability to gracefully and automatically remediate. Uh, so those are the key principles. Let's go a little bit further around how this works, right? I talked about the principles. This is a possible implementation uh, within an organization and how that might look. So it starts out with the cloud or the security engineers uh, writing a policy that they submit as a pull request. That pull request then is peer reviewed and run through the CI uh, that's uh, basically source controlled, right? Again, classic in terms of the application development lifecycle, but also a bit perhaps of that paradigm shift that David talked about when uh, thinking about you know, security and FinOps and uh, compliance uh, and better operations, right? Using the same processes as the developers is that, that paradigm shift. So then uh, they are merged in and pushed via CD to the cloud environments. Those policies are then capable of either being event-based, right? Responding to things that are changing in the cloud at, at the moment which they are changing or possibly periodically uh, if there is a schedule for which uh, folks want to take a health check. And then in the case of non-compliance as mentioned, having that, that, that notification loop, really trying to get the developers who may have, uh, let's say violated the policy, an understanding of the controls within their organization, uh, but then also the graceful remediation, making certain that that's automated. And that's really how this works, uh, as mentioned within the organizations that I've worked with uh, who have embraced this model. And it is, uh, again, very productive, very collaborative. It, it's really an accelerant uh, in terms of the whole organization's ability to adopt the cloud, to, uh, you know, let's say, accelerate their journey through the cloud and to really be uh, hyper productive. Uh, David, any thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, going forward, you, this is an optimization exercise. The reality is we can build all kinds of solutions using all kinds of technologies and your ability to get to something that's near 100% efficient, so we're gonna be a, a completely 100% efficient, as close as you can, is really the objective. So we can build all kinds of architectures to solve the same problem, applications, databases, things like that, governance, security, and how the technology is configured, and we can get to a point where it works. Well, it may work, but it may be at 50% efficiency, and therefore we're spending millions of dollars a week on missing the boat on opportunities for us to take the technology to the next level. The ability to leverage governance as code is really the ability to optimize the architecture. It's not the only thing we need to do, but it's really kind of fundamental to whether we make these things work. If we're gonna build these complex distributed systems, cloud-based or non-cloud-based, or typically it's gonna be a mix of everything, traditional systems, cloud, edge computing, those sorts of things. Governance as code is one of those things that has to be a contributor to the optimization moving forward. And it's gonna be, it's gonna be the proper fit 99 times of 100 as we get into these complex architectures. So keep that in mind when you go in there. It's not just saving money and being efficient and solving tactical problems. This is strategically important the way that we're gonna take the business and take the architecture. Very good. And certainly, as mentioned, just to summarize the, the productivity, the cost, the security, and uh, the capability to meet the, the compliance needs of the organization. Uh, those are the key benefits. Uh, Umer? Yep, great. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, um, if folks have any questions, we do have time for maybe one more question. Um, Travis, there was a comparison to Terraform um, about this approach and how is it different? Um, if you want to take that. Yeah, I would say it's a similar pattern, right? You're using governance as code to balance your infrastructure as code, um, not the same, 
right? But as David mentioned, uh, an optimization around your infrastructure. So an important uh, pairing, an important coupling, um, different but uh, similar, at least in concept. Uh, okay, David, any, anything you'd like to add there? Just keep in mind that the benefits here are soft and hard at the same time. So in other words, the, the hard benefits are gonna be fairly quantifiable. We can figure out improvements in production, um, in productivity, security, all these sorts of things. But at the end of the day, the soft benefit is where the value is. The ability to get to an agile architecture that's completely configurable and purpose-built and does get to almost 100% efficiency.